So welcome to the Memphis Astronomical Society. We are presenting our short course on astronomy and today we're talking about classification and measurement of stars. This will be in two parts and we'll have an intermission during which we will show you actual spectra using lab equipment. But first, kind of to tell you what we're going to tell you, we have always classified stars according to several different dimensions, the first of which is brightness or magnitude. Magnitude is a term that you'll hear and read when you're dealing with astronomy. There's also a systematic nomenclature that is a scientific series of names as well as the common names of stars. We'll go over some of the common names and some of the systematic nomenclature. There are a whole lot more stars named using the scientific nomenclature than there are with common names because there are an awful lot more stars that you can't see with the unaided eye than those that you can. And the ones that are classified with the systematic nomenclature are both of the stars that are easily visible to the unaided eye and all the rest of them. And as we've seen before in this series, stars come in different colors. So we classify them by spectral type, that is the kind of spectrum they show when you break their light up into its component wavelengths. They show a very large range of size and density. We'll get to that in the second part of our talks. And we'll get to distance, how far away these stars are. They range in distance from just a few light years, like the closest star, Alpha Centauri, which is about four light years away, to more than a thousand light years away. Those are the naked eye stars. The ones beyond that are very difficult or impossible to see without some kind of optical aid, binoculars, telescopes, and so on. Alpha Centauri, by the way, the brightest, uh, it, it is not the brightest star, it's one of the brightest stars in the sky because it's so close. But we can't see that star from Memphis. You can't see it from most of the continental United States. You can see it from South Florida, South Texas, Hawaii, uh, latitudes 29 degrees north and south of that. You can see it. I have seen it in Hawaii and I was very impressed by how bright it was. Uh, but that's because it's so close. It's actually a star it's pretty much sun-like and therefore not one of the most luminous stars in the whole sky, intrinsically luminous. And we'll get into what all that means shortly. Now here's a constellation that everyone has seen. It's the constellation of Orion, the hunter. We see this constellation in the winter and the spring. Now you don't see all of the myriad stars that are in and around it, certainly not in a big city like Memphis because of light pollution. That's the glare of wasted energy that we pour into the sky from lights that are not pointed down on the ground where the light will actually do us some good, but they're put up and pointed upward into the air where they're certainly not needed and they blot out a lot of what we could otherwise see. But you can see that some of these stars are obviously different colors. In the upper left of the picture there, Orion's right shoulder, you'll see a reddish star. That is the star Betelgeuse. It's a red giant. It's a first magnitude star down at the diagonal opposite, down in Orion's left knee on the lower right of the screen. You'll see a, a big white star. That, is the, that star's name is Rigel. And it also is a supergiant star. We'll get into what all that means uh, in, uh, later in, well, later this evening and then in other talks. There's another bright star uh, at the upper right, that is Orion's left shoulder, and that star's name is Bellatrix. You might, uh, that might ring a faint bell with you <clears throat> if you have followed the Harry Potter stories. Bellatrix was one of the siblings, one of the people in the magical black family. Uh, Harry's godfather was named Sirius. There was a character named Regulus and some others, all of which are common names of stars. All of these are first magnitude stars. Now look down at the middle of the, of the screen. There you'll see three stars on a diagonal, very close together. 
Those are Orion's belt stars, and they are all second magnitude stars. And if you'll look just below them, there's a fuzzy patch there. That's not actually a star. That is a great cloud of gas and dust. It's called the Orion Nebula, or it's M42. You'll see it referred to that way, M42, M4 Messier, Charles Messier, who cataloged a lot of fuzzy things in the sky that weren't comets when he was searching for comets to warn other comet hunters off of them, not to consider those comets. That's not interesting. Go look at something else. Well, M42 really is very interesting because it is a cocoon or a nest of newly forming stars. That's where stars are being born. Lots of them. You can see these young stars with a telescope. They are all about 1,500 light years away. That is, it takes a beam of light 1,500 years to come to the, make, cover the distance between them and us. Hipparchus of Rhodes was a, an ancient Greek mathematician and astronomer. He lived from about 180 to about 125 BC. He was the greatest astronomer of his time. He was born in a town called Nicaea. We, we pronounce it Nicaea. The Greeks pronounced it Nicaea. It comes from the Greek word for victory or Nike. It's now the uh, modern city of Iznik in Turkey. He did most of his work on the island of Rhodes in the Mediterranean, and he may have done some in Alexandria, Egypt, the capital of Egypt after Alexander the Great conquered it in uh, about 300 BC. He put together the first catalog that we would consider a modern style of catalog, about 850 stars that included how bright they were, their magnitudes, and their celestial coordinates, how you could find them on a sky map. He was the man who started the stellar magnitude scale that we will get into in just a moment, and the celestial coordinate system. Magnitude, brightness, is one of the most prominent aspects of a star. You look at stars and immediately you see how bright or how dim they are compared to other stars. Well, in the second century BC, he was the man, Hipparchus, who set up the first known magnitude scale. There may have been others earlier, such as the Babylonians, but if that knowledge was there, it wasn't written down, or if it was written down, we don't have it, have access to it. The brightest stars he classified as first magnitude. And the faintest stars visible to the unaided eye, he called six magnitudes. So there's a five magnitude difference there. Each magnitude class is 2.5, about two and a half times as bright as its adjacent, as the, as the one just below it on the scale. So a first magnitude star is two and a half times brighter than a second magnitude star, and a second magnitude star is two and a half times brighter than a third magnitude star, and so on. Well, that means that if you had, say, what's the difference between a second magnitude star and a fifth magnitude star, you take 2.5 and you raise that to the third power, multiply it by itself three times. 2.5 to the third is about 15, is 15.6, or it's almost 16 times as bright a second magnitude star is almost 16 times as bright as a fifth magnitude star. Then, first magnitude stars, okay, 2.5 to the fifth power would be 97.7 or almost 100 times brighter than six magnitude stars. And since this factor is very close to 100, Norman Pogson, an English astronomer who worked most of his life in India, defined this as exactly 100 in 1856. So, that makes the modern factor between magnitudes the fifth root of 100, or a little over 2.5, 2.5119. For example, Canopus is the second brightest star in the sky. You can't see that one from Memphis ordinarily. Uh, you can in uh, February is usually the best time to do this because it, when it rises, it's only a very short distance above the horizon, and then it sets very quickly too. But Canopus has a magnitude, a measured magnitude, of negative 0.72. It's a first magnitude star. It's brighter than Polaris, the North Star, the Pole Star, which is there because it, not because it's the brightest star in the sky. It, by far it is not. It's there, you call it Polaris, because the axis of the Earth 
if extended to the distance of Polaris, would be very close to it in the sky. Polaris has a magnitude of 1.99, a second magnitude star, so the difference between Canopus and Polaris is a difference of 1.99 minus negative 0.72 or 2.771 magnitudes. So the brightness difference then, the brightness factor, is our constant, the factor between magnitudes, 2.5119. You raise that to the 2.71 power, it's 12.1 times as bright. Another example, Mars in its orbit is varying at varying distances from the Earth, and when it's closer, it's brighter. When it's farther away, it's dimmer. So, how many times brighter is Mars when it's at its brightest, which is magnitude negative 2.8, compared to its dimmest, which is magnitude 1.7? So, take that, uh, you do your little calculation, 1.7 minus negative 2.8, is 4.5 magnitudes difference. Well, you raise 2.5119 to the 4.5 to the to the 4.5 power means Mars is 63 times as bright at its brightest than at its dimmest. That's a big difference. Another example, let's go the other way. What would be the magnitude of a star which is five times as bright as Polaris? Okay, well, you take delta M, that is the change of difference in magnitudes, and you raise 2.5119 to, to the delta M, the unknown factor. Well, it's, the answer is 5 because we've already determined that. That's the difference in magnitude from Polaris. And so you take the logarithm of both sides and you do the calculations and it comes out to be 1.75. So the difference in magnitude between Polaris and the star that we're looking for is 1.75. And we're looking for a star, again, you finish the calculations out, and we're looking for a star whose magnitude is 0 0.24 thereabouts. And the closest possible examples to that in our sky are Procyon, which is the brightest star in Canis Minor, the smaller of the dogs that follow Orion around the sky, at 0 0.37, or Rigel. We've already seen Rigel uh, there at, uh, in Orion's left knee, and Rigel shines with a brightness in our sky of 0 0.14. Hipparchus's magnitude scale, modernized, if you extend this to the visible things in the sky and the invisible things, or as much as we can see either with an aided or unaided eye. Well, the sun is the brightest thing in our sky, obviously. Its magnitude is 26.8. The dimmest things that anybody can see, we're using the Hubble Space Telescope, is about a magnitude 28. It's actually now we, it's uh, somewhat fainter than that, maybe, maybe uh, uh, 31 magnitudes, but the difference, that, that difference of 30 magnitudes is a difference of 100 to the 6th power, or that is 10 to the 10 squared to the 6th power, or, which means 10 to the 12th, or 1 trillion. And note that the differences, these differences are on the, in this graph of differences of 5 magnitudes, which means a hundredfold difference in brightness. Now, let's note too that the full moon at magnitude negative 12.6, that's not half as bright as the sun at negative 26.8. Uh, that's a difference of more than 14 magnitudes for a difference in brightness of, of almost 480,000 times. The nomenclature, or what we call stars, uh, the brightest ones, have common names. We've heard a lot of these. Uh, a lot of these, maybe most of them, are Arabic in origin, such as Deneb, one of the stars in the constellation of Cygnus. Deneb means tail. Algol, the demon, our, we have an English cognate for that, the gall or ghoul, the ghoul, the demon. Uh, it's a, an eclipsing binary, a variable star in the constellation of Perseus. These are an Alcor in Ursa Major, or in our Asterism, the Big Dipper, 
are the horse and the rider. And these names really have changed over the centuries so much that they don't bear a lot of resemblance to the original Arabic. For example, uh, Bet al Jauza, the armpit of the giant, is now Betaljaz, the first star that we mentioned in our talk, the first one that is the one that is Orion's right shoulder, the big red star there. Now, some other names, uh, a lot of star names are Latin, such as Polaris, the pole star, Mira, Myra, the wonderful. Uh, so called because it was so shown to be a variable star. It did not mean a, maintain a constant brightness. And this was a wonderful discovery in the 16th century when it was first found to be to vary in brightness. Regulus, the prince, is another Latin named star in the constellation of Leo, the lion. They have the systematic nomenclature that I mentioned earlier, the scientific names for them. They are generally named in order of brightness within the constellations, and they use the Greek alphabet. Uh, Johann Bayer, who lived in the mostly in the 17th century, 16th, 17th century, was a German lawyer and a celestial cartographer or map maker. He published in 1603 the first great star atlas, Oranometria. It was the first one to cover the entire celestial sphere. It included over a thousand stars more than uh, Tycho Brahe had done in his catalog a few years earlier, and he listed the stars in order of brightness within the constellation using these lowercase Greek letters. Uh, he was, by the way, an ardent Protestant. He was offended by the heathen names of the constellation, or what he considered the heathen names coming to us from antiquity. So he tried to rename the northern constellations from the New Testament and the southern constellations from the Old Testament, from the Bible, and obviously that just didn't catch on. But he named the stars within the constellations using the Greek alphabet in the order of the alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, so forth, all the way down to omega, all lowercase. Then after omega, they are named using numbers, Roman letters, and other means of identification. The letter a number is followed by the genitive case of the Latin name of the constellation. Well, genitive is in English would be what we would call the possessive case. It indicates uh, belonging to uh, that, that uh, individual, such as uh, constellations that whose names end in U.S. or us or um ending will change to I to, to uh, indicate the genitive or possession. What we would do in English would add an apostrophe S. So uh, an example of that would be Zeta Tauri. Zeta in the constellation of Taurus, the bull. Beta Scorpii, uh, the second brightest star in the constellation of Scorpius, the scorpion. 61 Cygni, uh, there is one that doesn't have a, a Greek letter because it was too faint for a uh, buyer to see and to, to name using the alphabet. 61 Cygni, uh, Cygnus the Swan, or Alpha Trianguli, Alpha in the constellation of Triangulum. If the name of it ends in A, if it's singular, it'll change to AE, which the we pronounce variously as either I or E. Uh, the Romans, speaking Latin, would have pronounced it I, such as Alpha, the brightest star, you know, Alpha Lyrae, or Lyrae, uh, in the star in the constellation of the lyre, uh, Gamma Andromedae, Gamma in the, the third brightest star in the constellation Andromeda, or 14 Volpecula, and Volpecula, the little fox. Most other names, there are other uh, different names. The Latin had several declensions, or ways of modifying the nouns, uh, depending on their gender and so forth, that you don't really need to memorize. Uh, but these other endings would change to IS. If they aren't already IS, okay, we're getting confusing here, but Alpha Crucis, or uh, the Romans would have pronounced it Crucis, in the Alpha, the brightest star in the constellation of Crooks, the Southern Cross. Delta Leonis, Delta in the constellation of Leo, the Lion, Gamma Virginis. Uh, Virgo is the name of the constellation, but Virginis is the genitive form of it. Eta Canis Majoris, Eta in the, the uh, constellation of Canis Major, the larger of the two dogs that follow Orion. Epsilon Bootes, Bootes is the uh, 
the, the driver of the bear, the guardian of the bear. He's always near the Ursa constellations, or Beta Ursa Minoris, the second brightest star in Ursa Minor, the, the smaller of the bears. And with plural names, because there are some of them, the twins and the sails and so on, uh, the plural names I and A will change to Orum, and while ES changes to Um or IUM. And I know this is getting very confusing if you've never studied Latin. It doesn't matter, because if you immerse yourself in this and you read enough ast astronomical publications, these things will become second nature, and you'll know what they are even if you've never taken a course in Latin. For example, uh, Epsilon Geminorum, uh, the twins Gemini, the, the uh, plural, the plural uh, genitive of that is Geminorum, uh, Gamma Velorum, Vela, the sails, Velorum is the, the plural genitive, the plural possessive, 17 Canum Venaticorum, Canis Venatici, the hunting dogs, is the name of the constellation. Canum Venaticorum is the possessive or the genitive form of that, and Eta Piscium, P, uh, from Pisces, the fishes. We've talked a little about color and spectral class. The light the stars emit is a mixture of all colors, but our eyes and the brain, which interprets what we see through our eyes, what comes through our eyes, perceive this light as being white or maybe tinged with pastel color. You may have heard people talk about red stars and blue stars and yellow stars and so on, and you can see that, but they are, it doesn't just jump out at you typically because they're not that bright as seen from the distance from which we're viewing them. Uh, it takes a lot of light to set off the cones in our retinas. We see most uh, at night, we see with the rods, which just see black and white, or sensitive to black and white. The cones are the color vision part of our, of our eyesight, and so the stars being so far away will typically look sort of pastel, uh, reddish, or yellowish, or blueish, but not a, a uh, dramatic color. Some of the 19th century writers on astronomy uh, mentioned there was one star that uh, the writer uh, in a sort of dramatic Victorian fashion said it was uh, is uh, looked like a drop of blood against the black sky. Well, no it doesn't. It's reddish. Okay. Different stars have different amounts of each color in their light and this causes them to have the different colors, but uh, when uh, light from the sun or any other star is passed through a prism, then it's separated into its component colors or a continuous spectrum. And here's an example of that you'll see on the right. That is the spectrum. That's what it looks like if you pass the beam of white light through a prism. And our vision extends from wavelength of about 400 nanometers to about 700 nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter in length. And so our vision, uh, human vision, is about 400 to 700 nanometers, ranging from the violet into the, to the dark red. Now, if you analyze the spectra of different stars, it will find that the intensity of the various colors differs from star to star. Cool stars have their peak intensity in the red or orange part. The hottest stars are blue or even uh, blue-white. So the color or the wavelength in science, we symbolize that by lambda wavelength, of the maximum intensity depends on the temperature of the star. And we'll get into that in some detail here in just a few minutes. Now the star is not necessarily though the color of the maximum intensity. There are no green stars. Okay, why not? Uh, the sun actually emits most of its light in the green area. However, it also emits radiation over a very broad range of wavelengths, and all of these others sort of wash out, or they combine uh, the colors mix to show us what we perceive as white, so that it's right in the middle of our visual spectrum of what we can perceive, but all of the other colors around it mix together and form white. Now, that's not the same as mixing pigments, by the way. If you mix 
uh, all of the colors of the spectrum together as pigments or paint. You'll get black, you won't get white, but that's a, a totally different topic. Uh, just a little word there on the side. Max Planck, or his full name, Max Karl Ernst Ludwig Planck, lived from 1858 to 1947. He was one of the greatest scientists of the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, in the late 1890s, uh, Wilhelm Wien and Raleigh, who is this Lord Raleigh, his uh, given name was John William Strutt, had unsuccessfully tried to come up with an equation to express the intensity of electromagnetic radiation as a function of the wavelength and the temperature of the source. Well, in 1900, Planck derived the equation empirically. That was in, uh, I think, October of 1900. He derived that equation, and then by December of that same year, he had derived the equation from fundamental principles. And that's a real scientific touchstone, if you can do that. Here is Planck's law of the intensity of radiation uh, as a function of, uh, of wavelength. Uh, on the left side of the equation, the intensity of the wavelength is this complicated function of wavelength and temperature. There are several constants in there. Pi uh, H is Planck's constant. C is the speed of light. Uh, T is temperature and so on. We don't need to go into all of those or to really get into how this was, was uh, derived. Uh, but this is, this is the Planck's law, and so we can apply this to different temperatures. You can see here on the graph, right in the middle is the wavelength in nanometers. On the right is temperature, the temperature of the stars in kelvins. Uh, Kelvin, a degree, a degree Kelvin is the same as a degree Celsius or centigrade, uh, but Kelvin, the Kelvin scale starts at absolute zero, whereas the Celsius scale starts at zero, the freezing point of water. It's a difference of 273 degrees, which in stellar temperatures is almost insignificant. So uh, we can take these as almost the same thing. They are degrees Kelvin or degrees Celsius if you add 273 degrees to them. On the left of the of the screen you will see the constants Planck's constant the speed of light pi and Boltzmann's constant K we don't need to get into all of that and why they are what they are but the important thing is that uh, uh, the wavelengths are functions of temperature and the numbers in the intersections of these columns are the intensities of radiation. The important thing to note is as the temperature rises from 3000 to 5800, which is about the temperature of our sun, to 10,000 kelvins, the intensity increases with the temperature. Look at the exponents, uh, the numbers plus 11, plus 12, plus 15, 14, and so on. Uh, those are the ones uh, that give you an idea of how much energy is being released with the increase in temperature. And you can graph this. Okay, This is a star of 3000 kelvins. This will be a red star. Well, how do we know that? Because you can see it on the graph. At the left end of the graph is the, the uh, shortest wavelengths. And the longest wavelengths are at the right end of the graph. Uh, the longer they are, the redder they are. Our vision, remember, is extends from about 400 to 700 nanometers so that you can see that the peak emission from this star, a star like Betelgeuse, would be in the infrared, below the red. We can't see that. We can sense it as heat, but not from the distance of Betelgeuse. We can sense it as heat from a glowing ember or from a stovetop. You can't see that radiation, but you can feel it. Now, a star that is more sun-like uh, of 6,000 kelvins, note the peak is in the visible range that is visible to us from about 400 to 700 nanometers. You can see that's the peak uh, emission of that star. And uh, isn't it remarkable that the sun's peak radiation 
has evolved to uh, fit the sensitivity of our eyes of 400 to 700 nanometers. Here's a star that is 10,000 kelvins, much hotter. Now look where its peak radiation is. Again, thinking our, our vision extends from 400 to 700, well, most of the emission of that star is outside of our vision. Uh, this would be a star classified as A or B, and we'll get into those classifications shortly. An A or B star, such as Altair or Spica, we can't see that peak because it's below 400 nanometers, the extent of our vision into the violet. Uh, it goes into the ultraviolet. We can't see that, but bees can see it. And here we will superimpose these curves um, with the absolute intensities. You can see that the hottest stars, the bluest stars, have the highest intensities. That are, they're putting out a lot more energy at all wavelengths than do the cooler stars. The sun-like star, they're the yellowish, uh, greenish yellowish uh, there toward the bottom. And the, uh, the red star emits so little energy that it almost doesn't make a curve. It barely lifts off the baseline of that graph. And here you can see stars of different wavelengths at intervals of 1,000 kelvins, 3, 4, 5, and 6, all the way up to 10,000 kelvins. You can see the normalized radiation intensity versus the wavelength at various temperatures. And you can see that the, the uh, bluer they are, uh, the hotter they are, the more energy they emit at the, the shorter wavelengths, the bluer wavelengths, and the cooler they are, the more energy they emit at the longer wavelengths or the redder wavelengths. Now here's another, uh, here is, uh, this is Veen, this is the man that we uh, mentioned uh, just a minute ago. Uh, his full name, uh, given to honor a number of people, Wilhelm Karl Werner Otto Fritz Franz Wien, uh, who I'm sure uh, being uh, German or Austrian, uh, he, he did not go by Bubba to his friends. He lived from 1864 till 1928. And as we've seen, he tried unsuccessfully to derive what we now know as Planck's law, what we just covered. However, he did notice that there was a relationship between the temperature of a glowing object and the wavelength of its maximum emission. Uh, you can, uh, can kind of see this for yourself in the difference between, say, a, a glowing coal or a stovetop, which would be red, and a, an arc welder's torch, which is blue or blue-white. You know, without my telling you, that the, the arc welder's torch is a lot brighter than a glowing ember. The result of his investigation we now know as Wien's Displacement Law. Now what this means by displacement is that the hotter the star, the bluer the star, the farther its maximum wavelength is displaced toward the short or blue end of the spectrum, as you see in this graph. Now this graph is using, by the way, angstrom units. You see 5,000, 10,000 angstroms. Uh, the symbol there with uh, the A with a little circle on top of it. Uh, that is a, a unit of measurement that you'll still see in astronomy, although mostly now we use nanometers, but the, the difference is uh, one angstrom unit is 10 nanometers. So the uh, uh, 10,000 angstroms is uh, at one micrometer or uh, a thousand uh, nanometers. At any rate, most of this is in the infrared. You can see the emission uh, of the emission spectrum of the glowing object is a function of its temperature. The hotter it is, the shorter the peak wavelength. In fact, this works out to something that is, it looks complicated, more complicated than it really is. The product of the wavelength of a star's maximum emission times its temperature is a constant. That is, the maximum wavelength times the temperature is this constant on the right, which works out to um, about uh, two point, uh, or, well, almost three million. So it allows us to calculate the, the temperature of a star if we know its peak wavelength, and we can measure that from its spectrum for, for example, the maximum wavelength from the sun is about 500 nanometers, 
and they put that into the equation. Now the temperature is 5800 kelvins or 5500 Celsius. Again, the difference is about 300 to 273 degrees between Kelvin and, Cel and Celsius. So you can graph this. You can drop this into, um, say, an Excel spreadsheet and put the formula in and you can see that at the maximum uh, the, the wavelength of as short as 50 nanometers, the temperature would be almost 58,000 kelvins and at the opposite end with a maximum wavelength of 1200 nanometers, the temperature would be a relatively cool 2415 uh, degrees kelvin or kelvins. They don't really speak of degrees kelvin, it is kelvins. Here it is on a graph and you can see uh, what uh, the table just showed you that the maximum wavelength here at the bottom as opposed to the temperatures on the, uh, the y-axis, the vertical axis, uh, there's a sharp increase as you get down into the very shortest wavelengths. Now I mentioned a while ago that uh, a couple of B or A stars, well this is, or, or B stars, A stars, what does that mean? Well, uh, they are classified into seven uh, main spectral classes and then between those uh, they're, they're divided into ten parts, or zero through nine. And uh, the, the uh, classes are, as you see there on the top line, O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. Well, that came about in a trial and error process in the early attempts at classification of stars. They started with all the letters between A and Q. But the astronomers found out that some initial classifications were wrong and they moved the letters in the order, shuffled them around, and some were duplications and they got rid of those. So that left this present sort of jumbled series of letters. And there is a mnemonic for remembering O-B-A-F-G-K-M. It is, this started uh, about the time they, they finished this up in the early part of the 20th century. And the mnemonic is, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. Or you could substitute guy there for G. Uh, oh, be a fine girl, oh, be a fine guy, kiss me. Um, now, people have come up with all sorts of variations on that. And one of my favorites, this is from, uh, published in Mercury Magazine in 1995. It's uh, only boys accepting feminism get kissed meaningfully. So you can think up your own. But the classifications, they range from the hottest and the bluest stars down to the coolest and the reddest stars. So O stars are blue-violet. Examples are Iota Orionis, the Iota in the constellation of Orion, the hunter, and Zeta Pupis. The uh, Pupis is the poop deck of the, uh, uh, the constellation. Uh, it used to be a huge constellation called Ar Argo, <clears throat> the uh, the ship that carried Jason and Argonauts, but it was broken up into, <clears throat> excuse me, several constellations um, about, uh, oh, 100, and 100 years or so ago uh, for convenience. So Pupus is the poop deck. The temperature in Celsius is 30,500. Uh, B star is just a bit cooler, or they are blue-white, and examples are such as Rigel. Well, we talked about Rigel earlier. That's a B8 star and Spica, the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin. Its temperature is about uh, 20,000 degrees uh, Celsius. A star is a little cooler, or white. Sirius is one. Vega in Lyra is another, about 11,000 degrees Celsius. And F stars, yellow-white. Examples are Procyon in Canis Minor and Gamma Virginis, uh, Gamma, the third brightest in the constellation of Virgo, the, the uh, Virgin or the Maiden. Um, Gamma Virginis is actually a double star. And if you look at that through a telescope, a modest telescope or small telescope, will show you that that is a double star. And uh, at this point in their orbits around each other, uh, one writer compared them to a pair of celestial headlights coming right at you. The temperature of these stars is about 7,500 degrees uh, Celsius. G stars, the sun is a G star, a G2 star. They're yellow, or yellowish green is the, is the actual uh, principal color emitted, but as we've seen, uh, they don't really look that way. They're yellow stars. The sun is one, Capella is another one, and uh, they are about 5,500 degrees Celsius. 
K star is a little cooler there. Orange, Aldebaran is one. The eye of the bull, Taurus the bull, uh, and Arcturus in Boltes are K stars. They're orange stars, and their temperature is around 4,000. And then the M stars are the coolest ones. They're red, and such as Betelgeuse and Antares. We mentioned those earlier. Those are giant stars or supergiant stars. They are a relatively balmy 3,000 degrees. It's nothing you'd want to pick up with your bare hand but it's far from the temperature of the O stars at more, 10 times that temperature or more. And as I said earlier, the, uh, within the, dis the differences between O and B, there is uh, O0 and O1, to, so on down to O9, and you get the B stars and so forth. And the, this early and late part is due to an error in uh, interpretation of uh, stars in their evolution, and we'll get to that uh, in the future in another one of the talks, but uh, suffice it to say that these stars, uh, the, the, the early and the late is really, it's, it, it's just a holdover. There really is not early or late. They were thought to be um, early in a sequence. That is, the, the, the interpretation was that all stars started off as bright blue-violet stars, and as they burned up whatever their fuel was, and the astronomers didn't know what that was, as they burned this up, they gradually got cooler because they had less stuff to burn until they wound up as red stars. And so that's why you could say early and late, although that really is just a historical holdover and really has no meaning anymore, no real physical meaning. In 1835, the first modern philosopher of science, Auguste Comte, who lived from 1798 to 1857, said, we shall never be able to study a star's chemical composition because we can't go there and get a sample of it. We couldn't get a physical sample of it, so we don't know what they are. But only 14 years later, the uh, physicist Gustav Kirchhoff found that the chemical composition of a gas could be discovered from its spectrum. And by 1864, just a few years later, in the middle of the American Civil War, Sir William Huggins, who lived until 1910, took the spectrum of a planetary nebula and arguably founded astrophysics. We can detect these elements present in stars by the dark lines that cross the star's continuous spectrum. We'll show you some examples of this in just a few minutes. These are absorption lines, that is, the elements jump to excited states, they absorb energy, they jump to an excited state, they subtract energy from the star's continuous spectrum, and they do this at certain absolutely definite wavelengths. And this pattern of lines and wavelengths is characteristic for each element. For example, the lines at 656 nanometers, which are red, that's hydrogen alpha, uh, 486 nanometers, blue-green, a little shorter, blue-green or hydrogen beta, uh, 434, a little shorter, blue-violet, hydrogen gamma, and so forth. All of those, all of those are characteristic of hydrogen. And we have found numerous elements in stars, including helium. That was the first uh, example of something that was discovered in a star, not on the Earth. There are helium deposits uh, on Earth, but we didn't know anything about them. And it's called helium because that the Greek name for the sun was Helios. And so they named it helium because they found it in the sun. These are the three types of spectra. On the top, you see the continuous spectrum. In the middle, you see the emission lines. And in the third one, you see the absorption lines. Here on the left of the screen, you'll see the continuous spectrum from the source before it encounters this sodium vapor somewhere in its transmission between the source and the detector, or us. And the sodium vapor subtracts out, so to say, the, uh, so to speak, the yellow lines from the continuous spectrum emitted by the source. Here's a hydrogen atom. There's on the uh, left is an excited hydrogen atom. Now on the left, on the right is a hydrogen atom in its ground state. It looks it's bigger on it's represented as bigger on the left because its its electron is in a higher energy shell than it is on the right. 
this excited hydrogen atom, it, energy has been pumped into it, and this boosts the electron into a higher energy shell. When it returns to its ground state, that energy's got to go somewhere, and it's emitted in the form of a photon with a certain wavelength. And these wavelengths are determined by how far that, that uh, energy shell had to contract, or how, how much energy it had to give off in order to drop back down to the ground state. Here on the left, we see the Lyman series, where the uh, electron drops uh, quite a distance, and the, these uh, are as they uh, get in shorter wavelengths, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon, so on. In the second one, we see the Balmer series, which you may have heard of. Um, the uh, hydrogen alpha here at 6,563 angstrom units, or 656.3 nanometers, that's the one that uh, you can see uh, the prominences of the sun and so forth. If you have a very special kind of solar filter, uh, you can see this emission line of hydrogen. There are the uh, beta, gamma, and delta also in that series. Uh, then the passion series and the bracket series, and they have dropped uh, not quite as far as any of these from the excited state to the ground state. Here is a graph. This is a, the solar spectrum, and the original drawing is by Johann, or, or, or pardon me, Josef, not Johann, Josef von Fraunhofer. He was a, um, an optician who, uh, mostly self-taught, by the way, he drew this sometime between 1814 when he invented the spectroscope uh, and his death at age 39 in 1826. Uh, these, he's the, uh, the, the name of the, the Fraunhofer lines are named for, me, for him in the solar spectrum. And you can see the peak there on the graph corresponds to the uh, yellow is, yellows and greens and so forth in the solar spectrum, and those are the ones that uh, the lines that the sun most strongly emits and the ones to which our eyes, by a curious coincidence, are most adapted. If you look at the spectra of different stars, you will see different elements in them. And we'll, we'll go all the way from O stars. You can see the OBA, so forth, down to M stars. Uh, there on the right, uh, such as an O9, uh, B5, and so on, all the way down to an M2 star. And their, their names, the star names, are on the left. Uh, the one on the top, you, first you see the, the continuous spectrum up there at the very top of the, of the, of the slide. And then at uh, 10 Lacerti is the O9 star, very hot star. And you can see in there lines of uh, hydrogen and helium. And then in uh, Lambda Cygni, uh, B5 star, you can see all of those. And then um, the third one, an A star, an A5 star, Beta Arietis, uh, and Aries. Uh, you can see, uh, again, some of the hydrogen lines. And go on all the way down to the bottom, to a star called HD 95735. HD stands for Henry Draper. Henry Draper was an astronomer who uh, started a catalog in the 19th century. He died before he could finish it. But here we see something that you don't see in the, uh, the other stars. Down at the, toward the right side on the bottom, you will see titanium oxide and terrestrial oxygen, uh, that is, uh, molecular oxygen, O2, not just O. You don't see these in these uh, lines, spectral lines in the hotter stars because the intense heat in those stars breaks the chemical bonds. You can't have these chemical compounds in stars that are that hot, that bright, uh, that they're that uh, uh, of that intensity. You'll see all that down to the bottom, calcium and iron, and then titanium oxide. You see actual compounds in the stellar atmospheres in a star such as HD 95735. That's not a really memorable star, and I couldn't point it out to you in the sky, but it has been uh, examined with the spectroscope, and that's what it shows. And here, again, at the top, there is the continuous spectrum, and then you'll see um, down, as we go down the, the uh, 
the slide there, the second one you'll begin to see emission or absorption lines in there of hydrogen, calcium again, hydrogen, um, and uh, iron and sodium, and again hydrogen in, in a different wavelength. The temperatures are across the bottom from, uh, well the wavelengths, not temperatures, but they, they're absolutely tied to temperatures between 4,000 angstroms, 4,000 nanometers, and 7,000 angstroms or 700 nanometers, again our, our range of vision. Uh, in the third example there, third from the top, is sodium. And you can see where its lines lie and where they correspond to in, some, in the emission spectrum there, number two. Um, hydrogen there is the fourth of the uh, examples and you can see where its lines lie and then where they lie in the spectrum from the star. These are uh, the, the emission lines that you see in the examples with the chemical names beside them, the element names beside them, uh, were derived from lab. These were, these were done on a lab bench. Uh, the next one, calcium. You see the lines of calcium and you, then you, you can see uh, some of those in the uh, absorption spectrum above. Mercury and neon are the remaining elements there. They all have a characteristic uh, spectrum, emission spectrum, and that applies because the laws of physics, as far as we know, apply throughout the universe. So that that's why we can detect the elements in the stars, Auguste Comte, to the contrary, he just lived uh, a bit too early and he speculated wrong. And that's, well, science works that way. You make a speculation, sometimes you're wrong. But if you do science right, you admit that you're wrong. And then you adapt your theories and your ideas to fit the facts as revealed by nature. Now, we will have an intermission here. We're going to show you some real spectra with lab equipment. And when we return, We'll consider stellar sizes, densities, distances, brightness, luminosity, and we'll touch on stellar evolution, so stay tuned.